people who want to know some specific questions about like what's happened to the California emissions trading market, why aren't there any permits being sold, you know, what's going to happen next, those sorts of things. Um, there's a bit of context to provide before I can really, I think, answer those questions. And so I want to try to provide that context. I'm going to try to sprinkle in some factoids as I go there. But hopefully any, any specific questions about California I'll be able to get to uh, during the, the Q&A also. Um, so with that in mind, um, and really I sort of approach this as uh, I've, I get questions from, uh, from reporters, both actually I talked to a lot of the business reporters who tend to cover environmental markets as well as environmental reporters, um, and they both have sort of different contexts in which they're, they're, uh, they're asking questions. Um, and this presentation is really my own self-reflection about my struggles in trying to answer those questions. So, um, so it's a cathartic moment for myself, let's put it that way. Uh, okay, so in, in putting this in context, uh, first of all, when we think about, when, when you talk to academics particularly, when I talk to academics um, or people in industry to, to some extent, um, there's really two different viewpoints. Um, there's the, the folks who work on technologies and technological solutions or think about them, uh, and they tend, to, uh, they tend to maybe have a little narrower scope. They tend to sort of think about uh, we have a climate problem that has a target of a certain amount of tons we need to pull out of the atmosphere, and how do we do that? What are the technological feasible solutions for doing that if we you know, get a certain number of electric cars displacing uh, gasoline vehicles and then we change the electric grid by a certain amount? We can get a certain amount of tons that way. Way. Um, you know, so various ways of trying to sort of tabulate and just work out the, the math, the accounting almost, of how to, how to achieve those reductions. Um, and then there's the sort of policy focus, I'm probably more in this latter camp, um, that really thinks about, well, okay, we have these technological solutions that we can sort of scope out, you know, ballpark at least. Um, how do we actually get consumers, firms to engage in these behaviors or adopt these technologies? Um, and uh, I think one subgenre of that type of, of research is, well, you know, if these technologies are so great, why aren't consumers buying them now? Uh, and, you know, sometimes the answer is, well, they reduce carbon and we're not pricing carbon correctly or they're, you know, they're not experiencing the cost of carbon. Sometimes it's other things. You know, we learn things about the technology um, that we didn't understand that's revealed by customers just not liking it very much. Um, and so there, it's important to sort of interact with both of these. And I guess when I talk to people around uh, the Davis campus and the Berkeley campus when I was there, I, I can sort of identify where people are coming from. There's people who work on the technologies, they want to talk about that, and there's people who sort of like, I talked to a lot of technology people, I have no idea who's right. You know, I used to run a biofuels institute and I would run into 10, 12 different people who had the best biofuel um, that was going to be the solution. And they were all very persuasive, but I had no idea who was right. I'm not a technological expert in that. Um, and so I try to think about policy environments that sort of let us discover what the right answer is without necessarily having to rely on the expert persuading us. Um, I guess the point I want to make, this is my own cathartic experience then, is that sometimes, you know, the policy narrative, um, we're going to have a, uh, a tax credit for electric vehicles or an EV mandate, which we have in California, that translates directly into technological narrative. Uh, we're getting a giga battery factory and we're you know, having a lot of electric vehicles in California. So we can tie those two things together. Sometimes that, that linking, um, as in cap and trade, is, is more difficult to make, uh, where we can sort of say, hey, we have this policy, a carbon tax or a cap and trade, and linking that to specific technologies or specific actions is a little more difficult because it's not directly measured as part of the policy instrument and usually it's more diffuse. And so it's it's a little less um, obvious in that way. Um, okay, so I'm going to just frame these two policies. I've talked about cap and trade already. I mentioned it. I'm going to define it more concretely in a second, but I want to place it in the context of, um, of what I think of as classes of policies. You know, one class, we'll call them targeted policies. I guess in California we call them complementary policies. Um, and the idea is we're, we're identifying specific sectors or technological solutions uh, and trying to come up with mechanisms to make them happen, to make consumers adopt them, make firms produce them. Uh, and they tend to fall into uh, what you might call supply push uh, ways in trying to subsidize the development, the research of, or or require the production of certain classes of technologies. For example, we, you know, it will be illegal to, to sell an a, a incandescent bulb um, or auto efficiency standards where there will be requirements on, or there are requirements on 
uh, automakers to have their fleet meet certain types of standards. And these could be either technologically specific, you have to adopt a certain mechanism in your gizmo, or they could be more general targets like, you know, your fleet has to meet a certain type of uh, carbon uh, pounds per joule. The units drive me crazy, so think of it as tons per, per mile or something like that. Um, and then there's the demand pull policies uh, where we're trying to encourage consumers to adopt a specific technology, uh, you know, tax credits uh, or subsidies for solar panels on your roof, um, or uh, mandates like we have a renewable uh, portfolio standard for electricity sellers in a lot of uh, states where we're basically mandating that a certain percentage, if you sell electricity, a certain percentage of that electricity that you are reselling on to your customers has to come from uh, at least what that state defines as a renewable source. So those are all things that some are more narrowly targeted, some are more sort of broadly targeted like in renewable electricity, but leave some general flexibility within that. Um, and then the, the other sort of set of policies, which uh, I think have come to be called market-based policies, which kind of, depending on your perspective, tars them or, or makes them look good. Um, the key about them is that they tend to be more flexible. They, they tend to articulate either a price or a quantity target on a broad set of potential uh, ob you know, regulated parties. Um, and they regulate the how much, for example, but not, uh, they're not as targeted in the how the reductions are supposed to be made, uh, or even on the who, which within this set of people that you're regulating, who should be doing the active reductions and, and who maybe will be doing less or, or no uh, reduction activity. Um, so they're, they tend to be more flexible in their compliance options for better or for worse, and we can sort of think about there's some people who want to see a sort of pathway um, that has many steps to it, and the more flexibility you give at the beginning, uh, they get frustrated when we don't start going down the branch they want to see uh, going down, um, and I think we, you know, it sort of comes down to whether we think we really need to be going down that branch or not as to whether we get frustrated with that. So they're, they're flexible. Um, I think the two most uh, talked about types of policies that fall in this category would be a carbon tax. Uh, or a cap and trade. Um, they both work incentive wise in very similar ways, but they have sort of uh, longer term um, and, and implementation differences that, that can be important. But both are giving a lot of flexibility in terms of the choice of whether to reduce and how to reduce and who reduces. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about cap and trade. Many of you sort of know this already, but uh, I just want to sort of cover it. Um, the idea behind cap and trade is um, that we are putting a limit, an aggregate limit, and I'm going to talk in climate sense, so I'll just call, call it carbon, but we've done it for other pollutants, um, an overall limit on the total amount of emissions coming from some set of covered sources. And, you know, the covered sources themselves vary. In the eastern United States, we cover just electricity generation. Uh, in California, there's a broader a uh, set of coverage that includes distributors of natural gas, sellers of gasoline, wholesale sellers of gasoline, um, as well as large smokestacks, um, and importers of electricity also, um, with varying challenges in terms of measurement. But the idea is we're, we're, we've got a certain group of emitters that we're measuring, um, and we're trying to set an overall limit on how much that group can pollute. Uh, how do we actually implement a cap like that? It's by creating a, a form of currency, the emissions allowance, or the credit, or the um, permit, uh, you know, different names, um, and you limit the total amount of emissions by limiting the number of these permits or credits in circulation. So any entity that wants to emit has to acquire one of these credits, either from the regulator or from some secondary market, um, and I think of it, it's like a game of musical chairs. There's only a certain number of credits out there, uh, and if you don't have a chair, you've got to do the abatement decision, which we'll call standing at this point. Um, and so by limiting the number of credits out there, uh, there is a certain rigid cap on how much total pollution can come from that group of regulated parties. Now, one of the issues is we don't necessarily regulate everybody, uh, and so there's stuff going on outside of the sectors that we're regulating. There's stuff going on in places that we're not regulating, and those are all issues uh, that really soften the notion that we're limiting the absolute amount of carbon, but we are limiting it within this group of people that, we are, that we're measuring. Um, and so firms, if they want to, the, the key here is that firms are making a decentralized individual decision about whether to reduce their emissions, spend some money to reduce their, their carbon, uh, or go out and buy a credit. There's no sort of specific requirement for any individual to do this, but they are making this decision on their own, and they're supposed to be following sort of normal, um, normal decision-making processes where 
if it's cheaper for them to do the reductions than buy a permit, they should go ahead and take that low-hanging fruit and reduce their emissions. There's going to be other parties out there for whom it's very expensive in terms of lost revenues or in terms of technological investments to do that reduction, and they're the ones who will buy credits from the other people who, are, who, are, uh, who find it more, uh, less costly to do the reductions. Um, and in this way, there's no specific sort of dictation of who's doing what, but it's happening through a decentralized decision-making process that resembles a market or is a market in some cases. So in the theoretical ideal, I won't spend a lot of time on this because, you know, we're, we're far from it, but the idea is that um, all firms are making this sort of trade-off between complying or buying a permit, and in theory, they're all, uh, they're all abating or reducing their emissions up to the point where that next step, that next investment they have to make would actually be more expensive than the, uh, than the permit, and they stop there, uh, or they're, and they're doing all the types of options that are cheaper than the credit. Um, the key to this, and I think this is where the policy uh, sort of dialogue gets a little hijacked, is um, any, a carbon tax and a cap and trade, the key is this price. You know, you're trading off the cost of reducing your emissions against the cost of not reducing them, which is a carbon tax or, or buying a credit. And so the, the key incentive here is the price on the carbon. That's the primary point of the regulation. There's a side effect here, which is that it generates revenue. Um, from an environmental economist perspective, that is a side effect. It's a really nice side effect, depending on, you know, your perspective. Um, but it tends to be the thing that draws the most focus. So, for example, in California right now, we'll get back to this, there's a lot of attention being paid to the lack of revenue going to the state from our cap and trade mechanism. But the price is still steady at, because we have a floor. The floor tends to work in a way that reduces revenues but maintains that price signal. So whether that's a failure or a success sort of depends upon which thing you're focused on. The, uh, the price signal that's going to individual people making these decisions or the revenue that's supposed to go to the state uh, or to other, other purposes that, uh, that are fought over endlessly in different jurisdictions. All right, so graphic example of this. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen a McKinsey curve or heard of a McKinsey curve. Um, this is an example of a technological sort of approach. I'm not endorsing the McKinsey curve. Uh, this is a really old one and some of the numbers are now sort of comically wrong. Um, but it's an attempt to, to measure what are the ways we can reduce carbon and sort of put them all together and sort them by cheapest to most expensive. So, uh, and this is just, it gets confusing whenever you're thinking of graphs. You think things get bigger when you go to the right. But in this sense, we're doing more reductions as we go to the right, and that means emissions are actually increasing in we, as we go in this direction. So the idea here is somewhere out here is business as usual. This is the amount of reductions that you have if nobody did anything special. Um, and then as we move farther uh, in this direction, uh, then we're getting less and less carbon. Okay? So we can measure emissions from this axis out and reductions from this axis out. Uh, and Okay, so the idea here is there's a bunch of different technology options that McKinsey sort of got a bunch of people together to, to sort of crunch numbers on. Uh, there's a lot of energy efficiency numbers over here. These are supposedly the low-hanging fruit. Um, and so commercial electronic standards, stuff like that, actually have cellulosic biofuels are, are quite cheap. Um, again, sort of we're, we're wondering about that. Uh, nuclear generation is quite cheap, so uh, we, we, we can wonder about some of these estimates. But graphically, the idea is we get a certain amount of reduction. If we made everybody buy an LED light bulb, that would get a certain amount of reduction out of the uh, system, and it would cost a certain amount. We can make a guesstimate of how much it would cost, or at least McKinsey did. Uh, now, the mechanisms, once we think we know the answer, we could approach this in a bunch of different ways. We could just say, hey, these are really good things. We should just make people do them. Um, they're cheap. In fact, maybe we'll get into this later, one of the controversies of this curve is zero is up here. All the redu uh, reductions below that axis are theoretically saving money. Okay, so we have to spend some money in technology, but they're saving people on reduced energy expenditures, for example. Um, that's one of the controversial elements. Here, the general idea is we can sort of try to sort them. And everybody would like to see the easy ones, the cheap ones done first, and the expensive ones, the really expensive ones, we don't have to do, and the other expensive ones, you know, we can sort of think about when, when we do them. Um, there's complications about dynamics and how we sort of move this curve, but the general idea, I think, is still worth framing. Um, okay, so the idea behind a cap is we're going to have a certain amount of emissions 
and we're not going to let emissions go beyond that. And that means there, there's only a certain number of chairs out there, and a certain number of people have to do reductions in order to comply with this. If everything works right, what we'll get is all these cheap options will be just chosen based upon the regulation. People are individually sorting, I'll install LED light bulbs because it's cheaper than, um, than having to buy a permit. Now, there's you know, issues about markets and whether people are seeing prices correctly and all those sorts of things that, that complicate that, but the general idea is behind the regulation, people are making individual choices to do the cheap thing first and the, and the expensive thing later. Um, if we set a carbon tax or a carbon price, it's the same idea. Uh, everybody on an individual basis is saying, I could either do this thing on the curve or I could pay the tax. And hopefully, companies are picking the cheaper one. Now, if you're a regulated utility, there's some other stuff that's going on. So we have to think about different market positions. But that's the idea going on here. And so fundamentally, where the market regulator types, the policy types, fall and get into fights with the technology types is we like to say the technology guys think they know the answer. You know, they think they know which boxes we should do, and they want to just sort of require us to do them, um, where we try to be more agnostic about that. We set up a regulation where I don't know which biofuel is the best. Um, we're going to set up an environment in which we think the best one will be revealed. Um, and then we don't have to, going into the process, necessarily forecast which technology is going to win. Um, I'll just add one el extra element here. Um, if we have a cap and trade market that coexists with a lot of other requirements. So this exists in a lot of places where we have a mandate for different types of fuels, different types of energy efficiency, different types of renewable electricity that coexist with a cap. What, what can that do? Well, if they're, if they're to the left of this bar here, they're a cheap option. People would have done them anyways under the cap, and we're just making them do stuff that's in their own best interest, and they would have done them anyways. It's possible that one of the technologies we, we uh, pick, and just the box I picked here was uh, biomass co-firing. So you're a legislator whose district has a lot of dead trees in California, and you want to have them cut down and burned in power plants. Um, and so there's a standard pass that requires that be a, one of the options or one of the, one of the pathways for reducing carbon. If it turns out that that is actually more expensive than some of the other options that we need to reach the cap, the dynamic is, is that that thing which we've mandated outside of the cap and trade market essentially gets shoved to the bottom of the supply curve. It's happening no matter what the cap and trade price would be. Um, and that tends to shift the supply curve out a little bit. We've moved one of the expensive ones to the bottom. And that means in order to get to our cap now, we don't need every one of those options that we did before. Um, and that has the effect of lowering the cap and trade price. Even though we're getting the same amount of carbon reductions, the reductions happening through the market are less. And so that can have this sort of feedback effect of lowering the carbon price. And I think that's part of what's going on in California and in other parts of the world. All right, so I'll just end with a couple of reflections on uh, covering environmental markets. Uh, actually, this is spurred by Deborah Kahn, who I now learned is on the next panel, ironically, sent us an email last week asking us a question about where are the reductions happening or where do we think they were supposed to happen from the cap and trade market? And we still haven't answered her email. Um, but it did cause a lot of internal reflection and discussion. So it was even more productive uh, in the sense of thinking about why it's so difficult to answer that question. And it's because caps and carbon taxes measure emissions. They don't measure reduction activity. So when people install solar panels, we see how many get rebates, how many get tax credits when you buy an EV. We can add those things up and, you know, there's debates over how much carbon saved, but we can sort of really easily identify the actions that are going on. When it's happening through a carbon tax or a cap and trade, there's a less direct link between the incentives and the measurable activity that we see. And that makes it harder to sort of say the cap caused that as opposed to some other thing. Maybe people would have done it anyways. Um, and so uh, these markets tend to draw more attention when something goes wrong, like it's not generating enough money or prices are going crazy or something like that. But if it's actually working well, we tend not to focus on it as much, which isn't, I don't know, I sound like sort of a whiner now. But, you know, it's sort of when it works well, we tend not to give it the credit uh, that, it, that it maybe should get. Um, so I, part of that is, is that they produce much more decentralized individual uh, decisions, uh, incremental 
efficiency changes as opposed to sort of big bang examples of adopting a, an exciting new technology. So they tend to generate a little less attention that way. It's just harder to write those stories because you have to sort of track down that factory that saw a carbon tax coming and decided to install the something or other, you know, to try to deal with it. They're out there, but they're, they're I think, making more incremental changes and it's harder to sort of make that link because nobody's directly measuring that sort of thing. Um, and therefore, it's more, I think, difficult to construct these narratives about how a, a cap and trade market or a carbon tax are actually affecting um, our systems, even though we think they are. There are academic papers that do this. They're sometimes boring. Um, they're often boring, let's say. And they, and they don't, they, they speak statistically. So what we can say is we think these things are happening, but there's less of a direct sort of tie to that, um, to that linkage. 